Hello, and welcome to another exciting tutorial in Maya 2017. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about exterior lighting, which is very simple in terms of how we can set it up and create um, lighting for small little scenes, like this very, very, very simple type of temple scene that I've just built for you guys, which is available for you guys to download. Uh, but before we get started today, I just wanted to say a massive thanks to the whole community as well. We've blown past the 1,500 subscribers mark, which just blows my mind. I've just checked the channel this morning and it's at 1,570. Uh, thank you very much to all of you guys for, you know, showing your support, following this, tuning once a week in to see kind of like a little bit of material with me about Maya. And I'm really pleased that you guys are actually taking the time to develop your 3D skills, learn more about things. If you've been following this channel for a while, thank you, thank you very much for your support. It, you guys can now do so much stuff if you've been following this from the beginning. And if you're tuning in for the first time, or you're somebody who's a bit more skilled, who just wants to find out some of the new features about Arnold or whatever, welcome to you guys as well. There's a lot of material here that I try to cover in some depth to an extent, but always check the show notes below so that you can get just to the uh, bookmarks that will take you straight to the section which will describe one specific technique or you know there's material that I'm going to be using today as well that um, I don't own we're going to be using some HDRs and some textures as well and there'll be links in the show notes below to all of that material so that you can download it and set up the scenes pretty much the same way that I have as well hopefully this will help the community uh, but again massive thanks to all of you guys you guys really motivate me to make these tutorials make them as good as I can and through sleep uh, deprivation, you know, and exhaustion and everything. I'm trying to get all this material out to you guys as quick as we can. So let's tune in today to what we're going to be making over here. And as I mentioned before, I've got myself a very simple scene over here, no exaggerated texturing or anything kind of like set up over here. We're going to be mostly focusing on the lighting as well. Inside the panels, as per usual, I've set up a temporary shot cam over here, which is just a little composition that I have over here. So we can see the sky, we can see this fountain pool area at the start of this and we've got all of these interesting little columns over here which will give us some nice little shadows over here. So this is the scene we're going to be lighting today for exteriors and the main thing about lighting exteriors, I do mention that it's very simple to do but I'm going to be showing you today various techniques that you can use to light an exterior. So I don't think that even something that I'm showing you today is like the one way of lighting inside of Maya or inside of Arnold as way. There's a whole variety of techniques. And lighting exteriors is very simple, but it's not simplistic in terms of, you know, we still have to start thinking about how to use and direct the light inside of Maya and inside of Arnold to create a nice, pleasing scene. So let's start off with a very simple technique. And what I'm going to be doing first of all is just showing you again the power of HDRs, which are a great way of starting off any lighting project that you might have. So I'm going to go into Arnold and I'm going to go into lights and I'm going to create myself a skydome light over here. And you'll notice that my skydome light is not as big as my scene. And Arnold doesn't really care about this. It's not like the light will stop at the edges of this sphere at all. Your entire scene will be populated with light. So that's a really cool feature. So we can ignore really how big this sphere actually is. But today specifically, I want to talk about linking some stuff up. So as per usual, we're going to use the color setting inside of the AI Skydome light to add an HDR image, which in my case, I've grabbed one of the beautiful HDRs from HDR Labs, and I'll leave a link in the show notes below for you guys over there. And I'm using the Tropical Beach HDR over here, again, to give me something very sunny, very Mediterranean over here. I'm not interested in it just for its background capabilities. I'm more interested in using just the lighting for this HDR, and I'll build a custom background in a little while. So I'm going to come into my scene, look at the color property in the AI Skydome light shape, and choose a file to attach to this node over here. And I'm going to navigate in my source images folder to look for the tropical breach folder. I've got a few HDRs that I've been experimenting with over here. And I'm going to look for the tropical beach 3K HDR over here. If you're ever in doubt, normally HDRs and OpenEXR files for lighting tend to be quite large. And so so look for the ones that have the highest 
uh, resolution and uh, the f largest file size inside of the document. And one of the things that I want to do as well is that I've got kind of like a preview of what the lighting setup will be like. I want to change the color space of the HDR from sRGB to raw. And you should see that this image kind of like brightens up a little bit in your scene. And this step is very much so that we don't apply any color correction to the original HDR that's going to be used for our lighting. And this will make our scene look a little bit more accurate inside of here. So whenever we're using HDRs or OpenEXRs for creating lighting setups with a Skydome light, please make sure that you change the color of that texture to a raw format. Okay, so let's have a look inside of Arnold over here, inside of the interactive render view to see what my lighting is going to look like over here. And my scene should take a little bit of time to update. And I'm going to do the usual setups, which is go and change myself to my shot cam shape over here and restart the renderer. So I'm rendering from my lit camera view. And the other thing I want to do is in the display settings, I've got currently a gamma of 1, which is perfectly fine, but I'm going to change that to a gamma of 2.2 so that it matches the display brightness of my monitor. And it's always great to know that I can always come back and save out a raw image with no color correction later on. But this is much easier to light with at least in my opinion. Other people might disagree, especially if they've got much better resolution monitors than I have. So, currently you can see my scene over here. There's already some fantastic indirect illumination going on over here. And one of the things that we should set up very quickly as well is that always look for the resolution of your HDRs as well. And this, said on the file that it's a 3K, 3000 pixel in X width HDR. And if I come over here and I open that up and I just rerun the render over here, depending on the size and quality of your HDR, you're going to start getting some very, 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 very nice illumination happening inside of your scene. Now, one of the things that I specifically like using HDR for, uh, HDRs for is for creating this indirect illumination inside of our scene because this looks really nice and really kind of like wonderful in terms of how to light a scene up as well. And if we had an HDR of enough resolution, that could be it. You can actually see that some of the shadows are actually inside of my scene over here. You can actually see the shadows from the HDR itself being projected into the scene. So this whole image can give us the entire look for how this thing could look like. And we could put the background image in here and it would be literally a carbon copy of what this looks like. HDRs are really important for a visual effects workflow. But if artistically I want to be directing what this scene is actually doing, I might not want to use an HDR by itself. And even though it can look absolutely, you know, more stunning than what you think you can do as a lighting artist, it's a good idea for people to practice to actually still be trying to light a scene using a variety of different techniques. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split my view over here, just give me a little bit of working space over here, and in the panels I'm going to look for the outliner, which should be kicking about here somewhere. Okay, so I've got all of the objects which are inside my scene. Probably should group all these columns and buildings up into kind of like a group later on, so I've got a little bit more space. But there's my Skydome light over here, and what I'm going to do is just press Control H on my keyboard, and I'm temporarily going to hide it for now. And again, the great thing about this is that it completely hides it away from the Arnold renderer as well. Now that's going to be good because it's going to be able to show allow me to show you guys a few lighting techniques for exteriors and you guys can choose your favorite one and you know I think you'll settle for an HDR at some point but it's always good to give other things a try as well because Arnold's got a few good tools. The first tool that I want to show you guys is trying to make a physical sun and sky using Arnold just to illuminate this scene. So let's get started by creating ourselves a physical sky shader. So I'm going to go into my render settings by clicking on the render settings button up here in the menus. I'm going to make sure that Arnold is set of my default renderer. And I'm going to come down here into environment over here and inside the 
background options, I'm going to click on the little checker panel over here and choose to create a physical sky shader. So I'm just going to turn this on over here and press play over here and you're going to see what that's going to do is that it's going to create this blue type of sky inside of my scene. So again, it's a way of filling in the background away from those default Maya black pixels over here. Now there's no illumination right now, but this shader is going to be quite useful to use in combination with a sky dome light as well. So I'm going to just hide away my render settings for a second, just pause the interactive render view, and what I'm going to do is go into Arnold, create another sky dome light over here, and I should actually rename these as well, so I'm going to take this first um, sky dome light that we made, and I'm going to call this HDR lighting over here and just to separate them again I'm going to double click on this AI sky dome light and I'm going to rename this one physical sky there we go cool just to keep them nice and organized so with those guys renamed inside the physical sky shape what I want to do is take the physical shader that we just made and plug it into the color of the sky dome light because currently this light is going to be all white and washed out like that and again some people would say hey this is kind of like a cool look as well but let's go a lot further than what we can do with just the standard settings inside of the sky dome light so I'm going to go into the outliner very briefly and look for that physical shader which hopefully should appear in red over here inside of my materials lab and you'll see that that's the AI physical shader over here so if I have my sky dome light selected in my scene and I middle mouse button click and drag the AI physical sky sample over here into the color swatch over here. Make sure you get to the checker pattern button over here and drop it in. That's now going to attach the AI physical shader as also the color of my sky dome light. So we're basically using this for two things now. It's creating the background color and that same color is going to be affecting the color of the light over here which is going to be great for us. So when I press play over here, there we go. Now this look again has radically changed what this actually looks like. This physical shader is a really 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 cool material and it's great for doing very quick presentational material if I don't have enough time to source an HDR or I just need something for presentation purposes or testing I might be making a chrome shader or something that's metallic and I just want to see how it looks like in a lit environment this is a great 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 little tool in order for doing this type of stuff it does allow us to configure a few things as well and if I go back and select my standard sh uh, my physical shader again again inside of the hyper shade. So let me just bring that up again. Again, you close windows, you have to open them up again. All there. I've got now some settings inside of my attribute editor over here for that physical sky shader. So here's some cool stuff that we can do with this. The great thing about the shader is we've got settings like the elevation and the azimuth over here as well, and I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing that correctly as well. So I'm going to change the elevation of this as well, and if I make sure that my interactive renderer is turned on, I'm just going to start moving this over here, and you're going to see that we're going to get a change in the light of our scene over here. Sometimes this can jam a little bit, and you press Control u or Apple U on your keyboard to refresh your scene, and all of a sudden as I lower the angle of the sun I'm getting to create a more um, sunset type of, or sunrise type of environment over here and you'll notice that this physical shader will change the color of the sky and it will change the color of the sun itself as well so if I put this up to let's say 80 degrees over here I'm gonna have like a very midday type of illumination bright very low and shadows just under the columns over here again beautifully lit scene and the background will update automatically with my lighting as well so these two things are playing together with one another so again let's drop it down to a little bit of a more dramatic angle over here so I'm gonna give it an uh, elevation of just 10 degrees you know very 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 early morning over here and if I change the azimuth property over here you're gonna see that that's the rotation of the whole scene as well I'm gonna tap Control U or Apple U if you're on a Mac keyboard over here to again 
update my scene, you can find it inside of the render settings as well, and you can see that little by little I can actually move the sun around to actually be positioned in my scene, and all the shadows will update accordingly like that as well. So you're going to see over here that I can come over here, and let's say if I gave it a value of 180 over here, so I've got the sun literally right in the middle of my scene over here, just near the horizon. You'll also notice that the sun is this tiny dot, which is in, see in here as well, which if you really don't want it, you can turn it off at the click of a button, and you'll see that the sun disappears, and it makes the scene change slightly as well, but definitely leave it on, because it's going to give you all of these nice indirect shadows, which is going to come over here. Now, importantly for us, the great thing about this as well is that we can actually change the sun's size. So we can change it from this pinpoint over here, and we can actually start making it larger and larger and larger. And we can go beyond these values of 5 as well if we wanted kind of like a Japanese type of, you know, land of the setting sun type of thing. We can have kind of like this massive kind of like sun over here. And we can also give it a little bit of a tint as well. So if I add a little bit of a color to it, that should change. Let me just update my scene over here, update full scene. There we go. And that should be the sun light, not the sun disk over here. Let's see if I can do something that's a little bit more dramatic over here. There we go. Now the sun is actually updating now that I'm making it a little bit darker. And you're going to see that the blue colors actually come off the sun like that. You can make some really, 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 really weird looking stuff as well. But best not to go off point. And I'm just going to turn this down a little bit like that. And you're going to see that. Let's see if I just get it to the right value. Will Maya kind of like just update with me for a sec? Or is this all going to be a really like all or nothing type of business? Again, I'm going to keep it very subtle like that. And if I wanted to add just a little bit of color, it would be fine. But again, white will do the job as well. So be careful with these uh, color tints over here. And again, this currently I think is kind of like a bit too big for my son. So I'm going to give it down a value of six. And let's just change the elevation a little bit. Let's put it up to 17 degrees and give my poor laptop a time to actually kind of like update as well because it's struggling with this physical sky shader. There we go. Okay, so a huge possibility of configuration of looks by pretty much just using one shader by itself. We're not really manipulating any of the settings which are inside of this light. If we clicked on it over here, we still do have all of our Arnold settings over here. It can affect volumetrics, it can affect cast, uh, cast volumetric shadows and other things that we can just turn off for performance reasons because there's no volumetric lighting that we've added inside of this scene. And if I wanted to change the resolution of it or change the exposures as well, which should be here as well, I can make my scene brighter as well, but I wouldn't really recommend kind of like brightening your scene up too much as well. The intensity might be a better value to use here because it's a much more subtle change per se. I'm just going to leave that exposure at one over there, but you'll see that there's a lot of configurable possibilities that you actually have just with this Skydome shader over here. So as with all things, no solution is perfect over here, but we're going to get some great shadows and some great placement of the sun inside of my light. But we still want to make the environment look even better. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to select this Skydome light over here and I'm going to press Control H over here and that will hide away the light over here. And if I press play, everything should go dark again. And if I want to hide away the environment shader over here, what I can do is disconnect that. Oops, if I push the right button, or I'm going to just cancel that render there for a sec, and I'm going to go into my render settings over here. And if I ever want to remove a property from any kind of like shader or thing that I've connected, I right click on the name of the area that I want to work in, in this case background, and I look for a property that says break connection over here. Now that should remove the background shader from my actual scene. Everything should go back to being black and lit by default, hopefully. And I'll give again my scene a little bit of an update, full scene. And there we go. Everything's nice and dark one more time for me to be able to make another lighting setup. Now, if I want to reconnect this later on, I can always go back into my hypershade and that sky shader with all the settings that we already set up, it still exists inside of my scene. So again, we're never throwing anything away. We're just keeping things and we can try out loads of different looks and then settle for one specific technique that we want to use. 
So now I'm going to show you guys how to make a little bit of a custom setup. Many times we might not be trying to replicate something that is very reality based, but we might want to go for something that's a little bit more stylized or a little bit more artistic as well. And just to show you guys like the fine control we can have, but still using a very simple setup. You're going to see that most of the times we're always working with some form of indirect illumination, which the Arnold Skydome light is absolutely fantastic at doing, and we always want to have some form of direct illumination as well from the sun, the moon, or whatever light source might be inside of your scene, even before we consider if there's any additional lighting inside of our scene, like raging bonfires or artificial light bulbs or stuff like that. So for our exterior scene over here, let's start off by making a very simple kind of like custom setup and start off with the two main building blocks, which will be, first of all, making a light Skydome light for the indirect illumination. In this case, instead of relying on a shader or an HDR, we can rely on a color to start off with, you know, and I'm just going to come over here and even choosing a very simple kind of like mid-tone blue or using some of the color temperature properties down here, we can start creating some interesting lighting for our scene. I'll just make sure that my shot can's renderable over here. Press play and again my shot over here and again I'm just adding a little bit of blue lighting into my scene and I'm just gonna lighten it up a little bit like that I'm gonna have the indirect illumination to be fairly kind of like cold and maybe a little bit gray like that I'm just gonna hit done there we go I'm gonna again refresh my renderer again just giving my laptop a little bit of time to breathe between the uh, Camtasia capturing uh, software and actually rendering things out as well. And then what I want to do is add in a very simple direct light. So I'm going to come into here into the old classic Maya lights in the Create Lights panel and scroll down to Directional Light over here. And if I press R on my keyboard to bring up my scale tool, I can bring up the size of this directional light and this directional light like the same way that we were working with last week its position doesn't change the illumination in any way it's trying to replicate the sun but we just have to rotate it round in order to get it to look the way that we actually want so what I'm going to do with this light over here is that, yes, this light is going to try and replicate the sun, per se. And what I'm going to do is go into the attribute editor. Oops, open that up. There we go. Go into the directional light shape over here. Again, inside the Arnold tab, I've got controls for using color temperature if I want to, or I can give this a little bit of a tint. I've got a little pre-made yellow swatch over here that I'm going to use that's going to give me a nice contrast between my sunlight and my cool indirect shadows over here and this is really where we can start pushing things further than you know what we could achieve with a physically accurate model even still being very subtle like this as well if i start bringing up my exposure my shadows of course are going to get sharper and sharper and sharper and the sun is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. I can actually go into here and looking inside of my Arnold settings, I'm going to turn off the effect volumetrics and cast shadows just so that my refresh time is a little bit bigger. And I can also introduce a little bit of an angle to this as well, because currently all of my shadows inside of here, they're very hard and very kind of like, uh, there's a lot of contrast between them over here. I'm just going to give it a value of 0.5 over here, and that's going to add a little bit of a blur to the edges of those shadows. Really, really, really nice. Now when we're placing shadows, it's really important for us to start thinking about where they actually go. And you can see that I've got them just kind of like going off here at 90 degrees to my scene. Um, diagonals is something that compositionally looks very nice inside of images. And if you looked at my tutorial last week about lighting the interior room, one of the things that I was doing was purposefully positioning the light direction and the shadows to kind of like give me some interesting angles. So we should always experiment with what type of de uh, time of day it is, how long the shadows are, and trying to make these shadows look interesting. And again, never feel afraid to kind of like rotate things around and see how they look like from the other end. Actually, 
actually this big kind of like building over here is actually casting quite a nice shadow into my scene like that. So I might just do this like this over here. And again, if you wanted to, we could also add keyframes to this anim uh, to this light as well and actually have it animating across our scene like that. I can also animate the color to change over time as well. And you're going to see that we're going to be able to create some very, very, very interesting type of lighting. But the main thing for environments should be that we should always be directing the eye of the person who's viewing the image in some way. And I want people to pay a little bit of attention to like the water and the sky which is over here. And I really want this scene to have a sense of depth, which is why I'm using a light that's very low in angle. And I'm trying to make sure that things like these columns have their highlights over here. So it's a little bit of a balancing act, but you can choose to light this in any way that you would want. I'm fairly happy with this setting over here and again I will put that now and maybe play around a little bit with the exposure over here and again I don't think I want to do it too much to an extent but again always testing to see what other possible looks that we could go over for and again I could always make this color maybe a little bit less saturated there. Okay, and before I start noodling like crazy I've got myself kind of like a nice lighting setup over here. Now the next thing that I want to start doing is I want to add in again a background color over here. But again, instead of using a physical shader, I want to customize myself what this is going to look like. And this is the same technique that I use for making all of the backgrounds inside of the YouTube channel as well for all the tutorials that you've been seeing over the last couple of weeks. And that for that, I'm going to go again into my Arnold render settings, look for the environment tabs we were doing before. And this time, instead of choosing a physical sky shader, I'm just going to create a standard sky shader over here. Now, this sky shader over here is currently affecting the light as well. So this white color is now contributing to my scene and it's adding a load of white light inside of here. Now, fortunately, Arnold and all of the um, renderers allow us to actually choose if something is contributing to the light or not. And one of the things I want to do is that I want this light not to do the job, uh, sorry, this background not to do the job of my sky dome light. I've already chosen my indirect illumination. I don't want to play around with that anymore. So I'm going to go into cast shadows and turn that off. I'm going to turn it off visible in the diffuse and off visible in the glossy. And that's going to mean that this background will only be the color. It's not really going to affect my textures and my materials down here. So I'm combining like the best of both worlds. The great thing about this is that you can have really weird colors in the background and that means that they don't have to even match the colors which are in the foreground. Again, trying to be a bit artistic but not too crazy. Now using a flat color is great, but we want to always have kind of like a little bit of a gradient to our backgrounds as well. It's really going to add a lot to actually how the image actually looks. So what I'm going to do is just close down my render settings. And inside the color attribute, I'm going not to attach an image, but I'm going to attach a ramp shader inside of Maya. And I'm just going to click on this over here, and by standard, it's just a black and white shader over here, which if I turn on the interactive renderer, what you're going to see is that everything is kind of like just a grayish type of color, because this is projected across the entire uh, sphere over here. If I start moving these colors closer together, you're going to start seeing the alignment of those colors. And if I come and find just the right spot over here, I might be able to just to get my horizon line just inside of there. So you can actually see kind of like if I put them very close together, there's going to be like this very clear banding between the black and the white over there. Now again, this is not realistic at this uh, this point. But we're not going to use black and white as our colors. We actually want to create some form of colors for our um, kind of like morning slash daytime type of scene that we can customize their position at any point that we would want. So for example, if I click on this ramp shader over here inside of this area, it's going to allow me to pick another color. And I'm going to pick kind of like an earthy type of orange color, maybe something that you might not expect for kind of like the ground plane over here. If I wanted a kind of like really kind of like sexy sunrise, I could add oranges, yellows, purples, you know, really go wild with this, but I'm going to try and keep it as realistic as I possibly can. So I'm just going to give this kind of like a white for its middle color over here, and maybe with just a 
tiny, tiny, tiny smudge of blue like that. And then I'm going to take this color over here, the white, and I'm going to look for kind of like a nice deep sky color like this. Now, currently the transition between these colors is set to linear, which is a very hard transition over here. I'm going to change this to smooth over here, and you're going to see that that's going to change how the colors actually look. Now, you don't have to really play around with the colors too, too, too much. You know, we can make this kind of like a bit bluer or a bit more kind of like desaturated as we want. But it's always good to get to a point where we just stop this to an extent and we start playing around with the position of where these sliders are. So if I take this slider and I just drop the brown, so it's really below the horizon over here, and I take the white and I move it down a little bit over there, I just want to see a little bit of a contribution, so kind of like, like having a little bit of dust on the horizon over here like that. And then this blue over here, I can start pushing it back or closer together. If I feel like I want to make like a harder transition between things, I can add another color in between and it will give me kind of like what that color looks like and then I can choose, well I want the transition to be a little bit darker, maybe a little bit of a changing color to an extent, or maybe a little bit brighter like that. And again, it's just your artistic eye that's choosing it. Another thing aside from white that works quite well in the horizon is just a little smidge of gray to an extent, maybe not too much, or you kind of like make a Los Angeles type of polluted type of scene as well. That can be an option as well. But now I've added a lot of colors over here into my actual scene over here, and it's going to start feeling fairly nice and fairly organic, and hopefully I should start losing that banding over there. So really adding kind of like these colors by hand is really allowing me to kind of like create some very, very, very interesting background. And so that could take me forever to customize with the um, physical sky shader. And trying to make something to look like this could take you a lot of time. But you see that we haven't really spent that much time at all, and we're still getting a lot, 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 lot of customization as well. And again, this is just another look. We can design this in a multitude of different ways. And this ramp I can access, hopefully, inside of my hypershade as well, if I look inside of my materials, and I could build an entire collection of them as well. So if I look around inside of my textures panel over here, you see I've got my ramp one over here, and I could call this mid-morning sunshine, something like that, or kind of like just leave it like that, very simple. And if I want to change that color in any way, I can do so. You know, so again, feel free to keep building more looks into your libraries and stuff like that. So we've got this very nice kind of like scene set up over here. And I'm kind of liking this lighting for now as well, you know, even though it's ridiculously simple in terms of just using kind of like a very simple um, Direct, uh, directional light, which has you know, been available for a long time, and then we're just using the indirect lighting from just a pure blue color. Now, if I want to, I could take this Skydome light over here, and I could just rename this Custom Color. There we go. And actually, if I can type color, that works even better. There we go. Okay, and if I want to, I can actually take this color over here and I can press Control H on my keyboard and just hide it away like that. And if I want to compare it to, say, for example, to my HDR, well, I could just press Control Shift H, reveal my HDR for a second, give it a second for it to reload over here. And now I've got kind of like a combination of two things where it kind of like I can switch between my custom look and my HDR over here if I want to. And I actually quite like how the HDR is working inside of my scene. And the main thing is that my HDR currently is using kind of like, it's not really adding a lot kind of like in terms of the shadows because the um, direct light is so much brighter that it's actually kind of like, you know, blurring out those shadows and not allowing people to see them. But the very fun thing about this as well is that we have the capability of using a lower resolution HDR as well. So if I actually have this color selected over here inside of these files from HDR Labs, there actually are a few files which are inside here, which if I look at the 
preview version, you'll see that there is kind of like this sharp version of what the HDR looks like, and there should also be a blurred version of that image as well, which if I have a look inside of my files over here, thumb preview environment HDR, there we go. You'll see that there's this kind of like blurred version over here, and this blurred HDR is much smaller in size and resolution, and if I'm not using my HDR for the purpose of creating like physically accurate environments with all of the shadows and all of their wonderful detail, I should see that actually I can actually optimize my renderer by using a lower blurred resolution version of the HDR. So if I take this file over here and actually replace it over here, and you give it a little bit of time to refresh, you're going to see that there's not a big difference between the color of that blurred HDR and the one that we were using now that we have some direct illumination actually coming from that directional light over there. And if I go up a level by clicking on this button over here, back to the resolution over here, and I drop that back down to, let's say, 1000 or whatever the size of that HDR actually was, you're going to see that we're going to get a slightly faster renderer, but it's still going to look roughly the same as well, because we're using this blurred HDR only for the indirect illumination. And if you just want a little bit of indirect illumination to add a little bit of color to your scene, you don't need a massive high quality HDR, unless you specifically are doing some very complex VFX work to an extent. So there's always a trade-off between kind of like using a blurred HDR for just some very simple lighting like this, or using a higher resolution HDR to get more precision in your shadows or to match it up with a specific shot per se. So now that we've covered how to kind of like set up some scenes, use some direct lighting, we could start adding other lights into our scene. But before we do that, let's try out thinking a little bit more about the presentational opportunities that we have over here. And let's start adding in some camera effects inside of our render to make this look even better. So let me move this down a little bit and let me select the shot cam from my outliner over here. I could also go into panels, uh, shot cam and select it from here as well if I wanted to. But when I open up the shot cam properties in the shot cam shape node over here, uh, this camera over here is going to allow me to add various Arnold type of effects if I open the Arnold tab, which is down here near the bottom. Now, here I can choose multiple settings for my camera per se, but one of the ones that I'm interested in actually using first of all is to start using this filter map option over here to create a specific type of camera effect that we normally call vignetting. Now, you can do vignetting inside of After Effects or Photoshop or Nuke or any other compositing program. It's a fairly easy thing to do. It's an effect that happens with cameras that actually have have like a very large aperture per se, you might just get a very darkening as it sees a bit of the edges of the lens over here. And we can simulate this inside of Arnold just by using something like a filter map over here. Now again, a filter map's a texture, I don't really need to download anything inside of uh, Maya for this to work. What I'm going to do is turn on this effect over here uh, with the interactive renderer, click on the filter map texture option over here wait for the list hopefully to come up and just double check if it's hidden anywhere inside of my scene. I had this bug before as well. So instead of that I'm going to go into the hyper shade and I'm actually going to make a ramp shader by hand. If not I should have just been able to click that button over there. So I'm not sure why that's not working. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to choose ramp and we're going to make ourselves another ramp shaver and I'm going to call this vignette just like that. And what I'm going to do over here is that I'll assign this ramp to that material inside of the shot cam. So again, I'm going to lower my render view over here, select my shot cam over here, and I'm now going to just click and drag this texture over here, which I should be able to grab from the textures panel over here, and middle mouse button, drag it into the texture slot over here, and now it's added that in there. Now, by default, this is not going to start working straight away. One of the things that I need to do is configure what this vignette actually looks like. And this should be a not a simple ramp like this, but if I go down into the options, I need to change the type of gradient ramp that I'm using to a circular ramp like this. And then what I'm going to do is flip around the colors. I'm going to swap the black 
for the white over here and I'm gonna make like a little hot spot inside here you know so I'm kind of like gonna move the gradient till I can see kind of like a perfectly round area like this I'm gonna move the white over here and again I'm gonna smooth out the transition of the gradient by changing its interpolation from linear to smooth over here so it's kind of like a fuzzy little hot spot like when we were making a lamp now this won't matter at all because what happens is as soon as I turn this over here it's almost like looking through one of those old movie binoculars type of things over here so currently my vignette is like really 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 extreme as you can see uh, this effect tends to be a bit more subtle than this but I can start actually moving the edges of the vignette outwards like this and just create a little bit of darkening around the corners as well if you want to limit the area like that you can bring the highlight closer to one another and again if I move this kind of like almost completely out over here I can do this just like that so again I can add a little bit of color to the vignette as well if I want to as well I can choose something that's like a little dark blue per se you don't have to be kind of like too exaggerated on the terms of how this look so it's a shame that you don't have um, more of a transparency option per se for making this object just look a little bit more transparent but I'm just working with some very 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 basic settings like that so I'm just gonna move this as far as I can off to the sides check that my vignette is just a little bit on the edges over there and that's now going to give me a little bit of a camera type of effect inside of my scene so really beautiful again I could create this inside of Photoshop but it just saves me the time that if I know that I want to put this little type of effect into my render I can actually do this straight off the bat now the camera itself also has the opportunity for me to change how the lens actually works inside of my shot cam to a certain degree so I'm going to start now manipulating the lens of the camera ever so slightly and I can do that in various ways by changing the type of lens that the Arnold camera actually has specifically if I want to bend the space I could add something like a fish eye lens to my actual scene and if I press play over here I should get this very warped kind of like a wide angle type of view for my camera over here as well and that's going to introduce some black edges over here which are not so desirable for what I want to do but there's this option over here called auto crop and that's going to allow me to kind of have my um, wide angle lens over here and reintroduce the vignetting to an extent it's pretty much just zooming in to that actual frame to and getting rid of all of those black regions so I might have to take my uh, camera make sure my 3d manipulation is turned on over here and that will allow me to roll my camera back just a little bit so I can reframe my image over here so that I can actually see the columns and the water down here which I will texture in just a sec over here but this is displacing the actual image per se it's not adding a lot to my render time right now it's still kind of like I'm getting some fairly quick renders happening inside of here so inside the fisheye camera over here we do have some settings to control the fo uh, the fo uh, the f field of view over here or FOV the 90 degrees over here will allow me actually if I turn the interactive renderer on over here uh, it can allow me to kind of like change the length of the lens a little bit and if I lower the value I'll get straighter lines over here and if I really increase the angle of the fisheye lens I'm going to get a more distorted type of effect as well uh, feel free to experiment with it as well I think the standard setting of 90 is a little bit Kind of like too, uh, kind of like too low for my value, and I want something that's a little bit curved. You know, it might be a bit exaggerated because I'm kind of like going for this wide-angle type of look over here. But I'm going to try with like with 120 over here and see how it goes, just so I can really see these pillars starting to curve like that as well. And the good thing is that that curve is now going to make that vignette that I added inside of here kind of like look a little bit better. Try a lighter color if it's very dark. You know, also in the uh, uh, gradient settings as well and that's going to start creating kind of like a nice type of artistic image over here now before I add any more effects to the camera over here I'm going to try and texture this material over here this plane to actually give me a little bit of a water effect now I've been using a little bit of a displacement for the actual camera over using the uh, fisheye settings over here uh, but my, uh, Arnold's documentation also has a way apparently of distorting 
using a regular perspective camera from Maya as well and oddly enough that's using a property called UV remap which allows you to use some form of displacement map here in order to bend the lens of the camera as well. Unfortunately I haven't found any documentation online other than the fact that it exists but I don't know how to create the actual texture that would distort the lens. So if anybody knows anything about that well drop me a line on the Facebook uh, sorry on the YouTube uh, channel and just you know leave me a comment or something because I'm really interested if that uh, can actually work that way. So I'm going to come over here, I'm going to go back to my fisheye lens, check that my settings are still turned on, I've got my lovely curves over here, I'm just going to pause the interactive renderer for a second, and now I'm going to create a texture for the water inside of this pool over here. And I need to use a little bit of setup and a specific type of texture map as well. So I'm going to open the hypershade up, and Let's see if I close my Arnold renderer down. Can I get my interactive viewport appearing inside of the hypershade? I can, which is great. And I'm going to make myself a new Arnold standard material. So this Arnold standard material over here, again, type in here, click Arnold standard. I'm going to call this material water over here, just like that. Now, it's going to be very similar to setting up a shader like we've been creating in the last few weeks for glass in our shading exercise as well, because water is going to have very similar properties to an object that's transparent, and that can refract light as well. So I'm going to knock down the diffuse color completely to zero, because the water is not going to have really any diffuse color whatsoever. The specular properties, I'm going to increase the specular weight quite significantly so that it's very, 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 very shiny, and I'm going to reduce all of its roughness down to zero so that it's kind of like completely reflective like this. The next thing I'm going to do is turn on the Fresnel so that only the edges are actually reflectant over there on the specular channel. And then I'm going to open the refraction settings over here. And inside the refraction weight, I'm going to boost the weight up to one so that the object is very, 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 very transparent. I might have to increase some things later on in terms of some glossy samples and some ray depth and stuff like that, but I'm not too worried about that right now. I'm going to give it a refractive value of the index of refraction, the or IOR, of 1.33 and press enter over here. So it's going to start warping the space very nicely, just like that. The next thing that I want to do is that the color of the water is going to come from two things, the reflection of the sky and also the um, transmittance property as well. So as rays of light go through the actual water over here, it's going to add more blue color to it. So I'm going to come over here and I could choose a kind of like bluish type cyan type color. Whoa, that's a little bit way too much. A little bit of darkness over here or maybe a dark deep blue just like that. I'm looking at the edges over here to see how that is going to work out. And I think if I choose just the right setting over here I'll have something that will be whoa. Again, playing around with my uh, with the color settings until I think I'm done. I'm going to start off with this color and adjust it as I go along as well, because I want to see what it looks like actually with the light inside of my scene. So with my water texture selected, I can close down the hypershade. I can come over here and I can right click on this object over here, hopefully bring up my contextual menu, scroll down and look for existing materials and choose water. Now inside the interactive view this might be the right color straight away but you're going to notice that it's very still, very flat and quite boring. So I'm going to go into my Arnold interactive render view over here and I've got myself a very shiny reflective material over here which currently because it can see the sky over here, it's creating like a perfect still pool of water over here, just like that. So again, depending on the angle of my camera, I will either see more of the light over here, or I will, uh, sorry, I will see more of the sky reflection, or I will see more of the blue color, hopefully, which if I switch over to my perspective shape node over here and reactivate the renderer over here, if I rotate around the scene, if I have 3D manipulation turned on, 
There we go. You should see that I should be able to see straight through the pool like this. And as I get lower and lower the Fresnel reflections, they're going to start creating kind of like the reflections of the sky over here and this. It's a little bit dark right now, but I'm going to keep debugging this until it works well. Now, the next thing that I want to do is add in some ripples into this material over here like that. So I'm just going to make sure that I am in my perspective perspective view as well inside of my viewport over here and what I want to do is start adding some water ripples inside of he uh, here. Now there's many ways of doing this. We do have geometry so I could add in just a little noise map or a displacement you know that would change the surface texture over here but I'm going to use one of the files from actually one of the Arnold tutorials which allows me to use a vector displacement map. Previously we've talked about about the bump map. We may have mentioned a little bit about normal maps if you've spoken to me in, per, uh, in person to an extent, but we're very much focused now on using a different type of displacement that does not exist inside of the Arnold shader directly, which is called a vector displacement map. People who use Mudbox are quite aware of what this is to an extent. It's kind of like a complex way of displacing the 3D geometry. And this is another tool that we can use quite well. So I'm going to make sure that my render view is actually paused over here. Bring up the hypershade one more time over here. I still will have to change a few of those colors of that transmittance as well. But inside my water shader over here, you're going to see that connected to this node, we have something that is called a shading group over here, which we haven't touched. We've pretty much been applying this water shader, but now there's this shading group over here. And inside the shading group over here, there's a specific slot for the displacement material alongside the surface material, which is the Arnold Standard Shader. So if I click on here, and choose to connect the map over here. You'll see that there's a little tab over here that isn't highlighted that's called displacement that contains inside of here a displacement node. So I can connect this over here and these two shaders together are going to create a different result over here. Now the displacement shader allows me to use various different types of displacements over here and specifically I'm going to be using this vector displacement property over here. You're going to see that this thing over over here it will allow me to connect a texture and I've gone to the Arnold uh, tutorials website over here and I've downloaded a, a vector displacement map that they use as an example for making water as well I'm hopefully gonna post some more things about other ways of making kind of materials and waters and stuff like that in other future tutorials but inside here you're going to see that I've got this ocean shape node over here, which if I bring up, now nah, my pre uh, preview is not going to work over here. I'm just going to open this file up over here, and you're going to see that it's kind of like a brightly colored type of thing over here. Let me close down my render view over here, bring back my interactive view over here. You see that this is getting now really crazy over here, and you can start seeing it's actually changing the geometry of my shader ball as well. Uh, if I solo this for a second and I just click on that solo button over there, you're going to see that this vector displacement map is a multi-colored um, channel which will allow me to create very complex changes of shape to my 3D geometry. And it's going to make it look really cool. It's going to create all of the waves and all of the kind of like nice little bumps on the surface if I give it the right properties. So I'm going to come into this displacement shader over here. We've got two properties that we need to play around with. One which is the scale over here and the other one which is inside... Let me have a look. Boom, boom, boom. I will get, it's not this Arnold tab over here, it will be an Arnold tab inside of this material over here. So if I select this over here, go into Arnold over here, scroll all the way down to this property over here called subdivisions, I will get back to this in a little second. Okay, so by default, the displacement shader for this material, I've found it to work best in the world setting over here. Again, you can have displacements in object space, tangent space, or world space over here. And if we just set this up over here and I open up my Arnold render view over here, I'm going to see if I can have enough space with here, you're going to see that these ripples start appearing on the surface of the object over here, which is really, 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 really cool. So what's going to happen now is if I play around with this scale property over here, that's going to make 
the displacement bigger or smaller. If I give it a big value of kind of like four over here and I wait for this to refresh over here, I might actually have to update my full scene over here. You're going to see that these ripples inside of the water, they're going to become more and more pronounced just like that. And again, I can add a little light in here later on to create some glints on the water if I so choose to as well. Now that I've got a little bit of displacement over here, this is almost like looking like a storm inside of a teacup right now. I might want to make this a little bit smaller. I can control how big these waves are by going into this other node over here, which is this 2D place texture over here. And this will allow me to tile my UVs for here. If you can imagine that this image colored image over here is repeating itself, you know, currently one time over there. If I change the amount of repeats to, let's say, five and five, again, I'm going to make even more ripples and waves inside of here as well. And you're going to see that the waves get a lot, 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 lot tinier. If I want my waves to be smaller, I can give this value kind of like, let's say, a 0 0.5 and a 0 0.5 over here as well. And hopefully those waves in the vector displacement map will become smaller. There we go. OK, not so stormy anymore, just like that. OK, there's a few settings that I need to play around with yet, because currently it's very, 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 very dark over here. So I'm going to see if I can get some undercolor kind of like appearing through this actual material over here as well. But let's see what it looks like from my shot cam over here as well. And just with the reflections which are in here, it's not looking that bad at all. We're getting kind of like some nice displaced reflections from the actual environment, as you can see over here. And to get kind of like glints and highlights over here, it's very much about where you place your lights. If I add another light in here, a spotlight or a directional light as well, it will add lights to this area over here. But with the spotlight, I could control just kind of like how many glints there are actually on the surface of the water over here if I wanted to as well. And the displacement map will add all of these wonderful little settings over here. Now, if this is looking very pixelated, another thing that we can do is that we can increase the resolution of the displacement map itself. It's not looking too bad for my scene over here, but one of the things that I can do is subdivide this mesh more. And if this mesh had more polygons, it would allow me to make more complex shapes of the waves if I so needed to. Now, currently this is not working too bad, but I'm just going to increase the resolution a little bit. So instead of adding subdivisions over here with the modeling tools, Arnold has a little tool over here that allows me to add more subdivisions at the time of rendering. And for that, we're going to use a subdivision technique, which is inside the Arnold tab, which is called Catmull Clark subdivisions very popularly used for a long time in a load of 3D software as well. Ed Catmull is quite a famous person in the 3D uh, industry as well, and his work has filled you know, the 3D industry for a, uh, for a long, 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 long time. But basically, this will mean that it will subdivide every time I increase this number. It will basically take all of these polygons and split them into four faces, and then those would be split into another four faces as well. So every iteration here is like a subdivision inside of a mud box or ZBrush. It's more than doubling the amount of subdivisions that are inside of your actual mesh. So if I went over here and gave it just a random subdivision of four, I've kind of like split this to at time of render. So when I press play over here, this will be a little bit more accurate. So if I come into my perspective shape, for example, and I just zoom into these waves over here, if I had like a really, really, really close up shot that was kind of like coming to the horizon over here, you'll see that all of these waves and all of these bumps will be kind of like really, 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 really smooth. And if I tile this loads of times, I'm going to start getting like some really nice kind of like shapes for the waves as well. We could boost this up further if necessary, but for my current camera, I don't really need to give it that amount of detail as well. So let me just make sure that inside here, I'm going to make sure that I inside my render settings over here, I'm going to make sure that I've got the right number of ray traced stuff going on as well. So I'm going to go into the ray depth over here, look at my glossy colors over here, and I'm going to increase that value to two. And inside the refraction, I don't think there's much refractivity going on here as well, but preemptively, I'm just going to make sure that there's four bounces in there because I might add a little texture in here just if I have the time because this tutorial is getting really, really, really long as well. So there we go. I'm going to go back to my shot cam shape over here. 
and actually before I do that let's just do a little test at this section over here as well not really noticeable right now unless I would add a light in there but those are kind of like some good settings for if I have anything over here and especially if I turn my camera if I can see actually inside of the pool over here as well so with our camera all set up now and a little bit of water over here kind of like inside of our pool let's start adding a little bit of depth to the image by introducing some volume fog and I'm gonna do that by going into the Arnold render settings over here and in the render settings tab I'm gonna go down and look for my environment over here which currently has some settings in the background over here but what I'm gonna do is inside this atmosphere tab over here I'm gonna click over here and I'm gonna create an Arnold fog shader for my scene over here which will look boom like this <laughs> So again, always get unexpected results straight away. Now, the this is actually quite useful because it's going to show me how to actually align my fog inside of my scene. Now, currently, the Arnold fog will follow one of the main directional axes per se. Currently, you'll see that there is a ground normal, which is pointing in the positive z-axis of my scene, and that means that the fog will start kind of like in the background of this image plane over here, and it will be projected in one specific direction. If this is a positive value, or if, let's say, this is a negative value and press play, you'll see that they kind of like switch where the fog actually starts. So I'm going to come over here, and leaving this like this, we could choose the fog to go in any direction that we could possibly want. If I change this to zero over here, everything disappears. If I give it a positive Y value over here, you see that I can create some kind of like fog at ground level over here. And again, this can be a look that you want to do, uh, that you could uh, do as well. And if I wanted to change how high the fog actually goes, you see that I can change this height value and it's going to kind of like cover the bottom end of my scene completely with mist like that, kind of like a bit of a Mount Olympus type of Greek gods type of look like that. Again, but that's a possible value that you could do here. Now, I'm not going to use it for making this type of effect over here, that's kind of like just a cool coincidence per se. I just want to kind of like show you guys how we could actually use this. Now, I want to be using this in the X value, but before I do that, I'm just going to turn this back to zero and put this back on the side just so that you can get an idea of how to control this beast over here. Now the ground point over here actually allows me to change where the fog actually starts. So if I come over here and I give it a value of like minus 100, my scene I think is pretty big over here, you see that it's going to shift it in the minus Z axis like this. So if I wanted the fog to start over here on the left hand side of my frame, uh, let's say I gave it a value of a thousand over here and you're gonna see that it's gonna be over there. But there's this relationship between the distance and the height that we kind of like have to keep manipulating constantly. So here I can choose to have my plane further off into the background, but if I take this distance property and I boost it up, this is like the starting point for where the fog goes, and you'll see that it very quickly floods my scene with this as well. The color I can actually choose, normally gray is kind of, or some sort of bluish gray is a good idea for the fog as well. If I came over here and sampled a color from here from the background, that's actually going to be a good color for me to actually use with this fog over here. Because what I'm going to do with it, if I get my settings just right, I'm going to keep my distance to be at a very low value for now. So I'm going to turn that to 0 0.0005, something like that. So I've got this very thin layer of fog over here. And the distance itself is going to be where the fog is spreading from this this point, which currently is looking down the side of my scene like that. A little bit difficult to explain, but I'm going to be jumping to the perspective view so that you guys can see what it is that I'm actually doing. Because what I want to do is that I want to take this scene over here. I'm going to go into my perspective shape view over here, look back in it inside of my viewport over here, and hopefully as I pan around, I should see that my fog is like visible from this side over here. So what I'm going to do, which actually should have kept that color but fortunately Maya remembers slightly. I'll come back and I'll change that later and I'll just choose a mid-tone gray for now, kind of like to make sure that we can actually see something like this, okay? So I'm gonna come over here and I am going to 
go and change the direction of my fog from the z-axis to be on the x-axis, which is why I aligned my scene kind of like in this way over here. Okay, so as soon as I look at this from this side over here, you can see that I got a little bit of environment fog over here in the background, which is really, 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 really cool. Uh, I could also change the ground point of this fog of where does this fog actually begin and as I go drawing out the distance you're going to see that the fog is going to be like murkier but it's not going to pass past this point where it starts. So if I want the fog to actually start further forward or further back I'm going to have to change the ground point over here which again if I give it like a 500 step over here you're going to see that the fog is going to come closer and closer and closer to camera in the same way that if I add a negative value it's going to start moving away from the camera like that which is kind of like a little bit of the effect that I actually want. Now again as soon as I change the distance value you know that's going to start giving me a few problems over here. So I'm going to use the height to kind of like decide how much fog I actually want to have in my scene. It's almost like controlling the density inside of my scene and what I'm going to do next is just come over here and I'm going to keep moving this ground plane, sorry, at this ground point further and further and further back maybe like a thousand pixels just like that. Okay, so now when I come into my shot cam over here, I'm still going to have to do some adjustments over here. This is now really, really, really intense fog, as you can see before. And as I mentioned before, it's probably better for me to kind of like grab a nice bluish color like what we had in the, uh, in the sky, desaturate it a little bit, give it a little bit of gray, and as soon as I get this into the right point in my scene it's going to start looking a lot better, but I just need to send it further back over here as well. So I'm just going to type in again, sending it back like five meters at a time because my scene is actually in meters over here. Let's try 3000 over here. Whoa! 3000 extra zero. There we go. Okay, way too much, but that gives me kind of like a good ballpark figure to actually start working with. So I think that 2750, a little bit closer. I just want to add a little bit of a blue tint over here. You'll also notice that I'm actually destroying with this fog my actual colors of my background over here. So I'm just going to see if I can change the density of that just a little bit just by lowering this down. Maybe a little bit might be able to get away with that. So I'm going to come over here and I will go fixing this in just a second over here. I just want to add a little bit of bluish type pixels back here. 200. There we go. And now if I get the distance just about right, I can actually start revealing a little bit of my background, but hopefully still keeping a little bit of that bluish type of tint from the fog inside of here. So again, it's this balancing act between the distance, the height, and the ground point over here. Again, minus 2000. There we go. And again, give it a little bit of height distance like that, and there we go. I just want to get it to the point where it's visible just by a little smidge, and I should probably look at a render region inside of here just so that it's rendering that out just a little bit faster over there. Okay, so it's a very subtle effect. Take a snapshot if you need to as well, but again, I'm just going to exaggerate it here just a little bit like that, where this is going to add a little bit of that kind of like shade of blue inside of my scene as well. And as I mentioned, you know, I just want it to be a little bit visible like that, but it's almost like having a vertical gradient that is kind of like in your scene. And you could make the entire scene completely foggy as well if you wanted to as well you know but there we go again as I said before just playing around with that transparency so that I can see still a little bit of my sky it would probably work better if the color of the sky was just a little bit kind of like more extreme and I make this kind of like distance between the start of the fog and the height just a little bit more subtle but that's already adding kind of like a load of value for me over here and currently I've got quite a busy noisy image over here but I'm about to amp up all of the sampling which is inside of here because I'm going to have to add a few more things as well. So there we go. We have ourselves kind of like the starting point for creating our exterior lighting over here. The last thing that I could do to completely model this up even further is I could also choose to add some depth of field to my shot as well if I wanted to. But now's the time when I'm going to have to start cranking up some of the render settings as well to get a smoother rendering finished over here. And one of the things that I know that I can do over here is not the refraction 
position anti-aliasing, which I changed again wrongly. I should have been changing the ray depth over here as well. You need to make sure that my refraction down here was set to four or a higher value over here. But I can take the subsurface scattering, turn that to zero, turn. We do have a little bit of refractiveness over here. Glossy samples are up to two over here. And if I start giving this a higher value, over here. I might have to increase some of the sampling in my lights as well, but let's say if I gave it an initial anti-aliasing value of, I'll do it for four for now, I'll probably crank it up to six in a second when I actually play around with that. I'm going to come into here with my directional light. Inside of Arnold, I'm going to boost up my, sub, uh, my sample rate over here to something like four, and then I'll grab this light over here and make sure that the samples for this are set to like a value of three to start smoothing out all of these shadows over here as well. This, this light will affect volumetrics over here, and I think that this one over here doesn't have to as well, so everything's going to be nice and sharp like that. So let's do a little bit of a test render over here, see how fast this is refreshing. And hopefully you're going to see some dulling down of the noise in these areas over here. Just a little smidge like that. Pretty good. And as I mentioned before, I'm not going to go too crazy with this because I'm actually going to start blurring all of this up in just a second. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to go into, again, my shot cam properties inside of my outliners. I'm going to go to shot cam. I'm going to go down to depth of field over here. And not depth of field on the camera, sorry. That's actually inside the Arnold tab. There is a depth of field property around here, over here, which is enable DOF over here. And I'm going to turn that on, and I need to change a few settings, for example. Now, first of all, when I turn it on, nothing is actually happening because I need to change this aperture size over here and I need to control this focal distance. It can be a good idea to change the aperture blades type as well. So this could be like a six bladed camera as well. You're not going to really notice this unless you have some lighting inside of your scene. Uh, but as I start br uh, bringing up this aperture size over here, you're going to see that the whole image starts blurring out. So again, you just need a very subtle value over here. I'm just going to choose a point one over here and Arnold's going to do quite a good job of kind of like blurring out everything over here. It will be quite intensive for us to smooth all of this down. But the important thing with this camera is that we need to set its focal distance because currently only one centimeter in front of the camera is actually in focus and that's not really going to work for my scene at all. I could type in an arbitrary number like a thousand like this and you'll see that you know now most of the image is actually in focus over here. If you want a specific value Value. I do believe that if we look at where the camera is, say for example in the orthographic view over here, and I'm going to go into the top view just for a quick second over here, see if I still have my shot cam selected, there it is. Uh, I can actually measure the distance of where the camera actually is and choose where the focal point of my image would actually be. Again, it would be more accurate if I did this in the perspective view from point to point, but again, I'm just going to rush through this reasonably quickly by going to create, go into the measuring tools and choose the distance tool, and just do a little click here where the camera starts, and let's say somewhere where these columns would kind of like be in the middle over here, and it gives me a measurement of about 700 hundred and thirty nine centimeters like that. So I'm going to come into my perspective view one more time over here and I'm going to again select my shot cam around here. There we go. And inside the focus distance over here I'm going to put that value in of 739. It's not a hundred percent accurate but again you know it's just to add a little bit of depth of field in the right place. So I'm now going to open up the Arnold render view over here and now that my focus distance is set I can now really start playing around with this aperture and uh, uh, with the aperture size per se. And as I start making this value larger, so if I give it a value of one, you're going to see that nothing really happens. If I start boosting this value beyond this point, let's say to five, let's see if something starts happening over here and I start getting a very sight subtle blur happening there we go in the background as you can see over there and there'll be a blur near this region over here but hopefully this pillar and this pillar should be a little bit more in focus as well 
I'm hoping that that's the distance that we have to introduce over here. As I mentioned before, I could get it wrong by a few pixels, but again, it's going to add just a little bit of a photographic effect. And this would probably work better for a portrait picture rather than a landscape picture per se. But it's going to give Arnold a lot of extra things to actually be working on over here. But we're starting to add more photographic elements into our scene. And again, I c there is a reason as well where I could actually have kind of just chosen like the front of the pool to be in focus and the rest of it to be out of focus as well but if I want that I can also chain it, turn down the aperture size to something like three and as the aperture size gets smaller and smaller more objects will be in focus I really just want like the background elements that are the furthest away to have a little bit of that blue fog and for them to have a little bit of that blur over there to keep pushing that sense of depth so a lot about lighting exteriors is about the lighting itself, which to be set up can be very easy, it can be very realistic, it can be completely physically accurate, it can be a little bit more crazy as you can see as well, because you can configure all of the lights and all of the settings as well, but when presenting your work, the choice of the camera and where it's positioned can really add a lot to that, and I love the fact that Arnold gives you tools to be able to make your scenes look a little bit more photographic in nature. And if you've got experience in how to render out scenes for you know different types of projects or take pictures you know with a camera you can start adding part of that work into your 3d and that really kind of like brings things to life because it's a real important fact that we're trying to replicate what a film or photo camera could actually see and the more tools that we have to do that the better our imagery is going to look. So again, a very simple scene with really, really, really basic texturing, just a little bit of an introduction about some vector displacement stuff, but if you guys like that, I can do some more material based on, you know, more complex shaders and other stuff like that, but you can really start seeing the potential of lighting, interacting with specific textures, and adding camera effects on top of this is a really fantastic way of making some amazing 3D scenes. So with that, I'm going to leave it there for today. Uh, thank you again very much for tuning in this week, and I will be seeing you guys next week with another Maya tutorial as well. Thanks very much. Keep learning, keep strong, and if you really like the channel, well, give us a like or share it with your friends or post it or embed it somewhere on a website so other people can find it as well. I really hope the, the community likes it and that we keep you know, making great videos together in the future. So until then, take care. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.